God is speaking to us through the book of Ephesians, and we've learned so much. Uh, the last two weeks were absolutely incredible because Jono and Kenny did a phenomenal job unpacking God's word and doing so faithfully. Man, we have some amazing preachers here at Rooted Fellowship. Amen? Yeah. I mean, just nugget after nugget after nugget. I, I was convicted, I was encouraged. I was just simply blown away, and, and not so much because of Jono and Kenny, and yes, they were amazing, but I was blown away by God's word, that it continues to speak to us. Yes, these are, are ancient words, they are old words, but they are not dead words. They are very much alive, and they meet us where we are, and so my hope this morning as we unpack Ephesians chapter 4, that, that God would do that which he has been doing these last few weeks, that he would meet us where we are, that we would hear from him. And so if you have your Bible, whether it's a physical one uh, with pages, real pages, uh, or whether it's on your phone, uh, meet me in Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to uh, pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, uh, that God would do uh, that which only he can do, uh, and that is save many, reconcile many, restore many for his glory and for our joy. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. It's living, it is active. And so, Lord, I pray that you would meet each and every one of us where we are. That many of us have walked in here with, with so much on our mind and so much uh, in our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you cause us to be still enough so that we might see and experience you through your word? I pray against the evil one. His desires are to steal, kill, and destroy, to bring about division where you bring unity. And so, Lord, watch over us. I pray that everything that we do would be a sweet fragrance unto you, that it would honor you, that it would glorify you. Use me as an instrument this morning, Lord. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords those things you'd have us know, say, and do. Lord, may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer have your way in this place in Jesus' mighty and beautiful name. Amen. 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 So, so many theologians, they say this about the book of Ephesians. They say the first three chapters serve as a kind of introduction to the book of Ephesians. Because what Paul does in the first three chapters is he lays out the gospel. He makes it plain. He says that, that, that we cannot come to the Father except through the Son, Jesus Christ. It's His death and resurrection that allows us to be reconciled to the Father. And as that happens, we are then reconciled to one another, that this is a gospel implication. He then tells us that, that, that the church has a purpose. In many ways, we could say it this way, that the church has always been God's plan A. That the manifold wisdom of God is being displayed through the church. All this because of the gospel. And so the first three chapters, that's what Paul is doing. He's just laying out the gospel. He's, he's wanting us to be anchored and to be secured in the gospel. See, what happens after that is he goes, okay, now here's how the gospel works itself out in the context of community. Here's what it looks like in marriage. Here's what it looks like in your workplace. Here's how it looks like in family with parenting. He, he lays it all out. And so that's what we're going to start this morning. The, the, the implications of the gospel as they work themselves out in the context of community. Ephesians chapter 4. And so Paul writes, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, the prisoner in the Lord. It's interesting here. Because Paul is in prison. He's, he's under house arrest. Uh, Jono alluded to this when he preached Ephesians chapter 3. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1, uh, Paul tells us that he's, he's in prison on behalf of the Gentiles. Now, let me explain what's going on here. Paul is under house arrest because Paul is causing riots. And not for his namesake. It's happening because he's being faithful to the gospel. 
If you go read Acts, you can start about Acts 16, 17, you see all of this kind of unfold. See, Paul shows up and he preaches the gospel and people are saved and now they're walking away from idolatry. They're walking away from the worship of of these, these, these idols that had been carved by human hands. One in particular is Artemis. And, and the gospel is it's at work, friends. That so many people are coming to faith that it's impacting the economy of those who are carving these idols. Yeah. And so they get upset because now all of a sudden people aren't coming to buy these little statues. And so friend, people start going, you know, Paul, this, this isn't working for us. It's affecting the pocket. Yeah. And so they start spreading rumors And so now there's this massive riot because people are trying to kill Paul. This is what happens if you're going to be faithful to the gospel. Brace yourself. Root of fellowship, brace yourself. When we go out there and we preach the good news of Jesus, to think that we are not going to come up against opposition is foolishness. And so a riot starts. But he manages to get away from all of that. Uh, But then... Some, some other rumors start that Paul is letting Gentiles into the temple, into the places that Gentiles were not allowed to go into. We saw this a couple of weeks ago, that these were man-made rules. That originally the temple only had two courts, one for the priests and one for everyone else. But when it had been rebuilt, then because we are sinful, And left to our own, we will always choose ourselves. They ended up constructing multiple courts and creating divisions for financial gain. And so Paul comes and he says, no, the gospel is for all people. For all people. Jews and Gentiles. And so a, a, a rumor starts that, well, hey, guys, Paul's out there preaching the gospel and he's allowing Gentiles into the places that they're not allowed to, which was false. Paul wasn't doing that. He was simply preaching the gospel and its implications. Yeah. But people didn't like that. And so a riot starts. They wanted to kill him. And it was at that point that Paul whips out his uh, Roman passport and goes, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. And so they're like, okay, cool. And then he needs to go to Rome. And that's how he ended up under house arrest in Rome. It says, therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord. Because Paul sees that all of this is, be, is for God's glory. All of this is happening for the Lord. And so if you're going to call me a prisoner, call me a prisoner in the Lord. It's for Jesus. And so friends, when you're being persecuted, when you're going uh, uh, under or against opposition, is it for the Lord? Is it for His glory? It's a question to ask. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. To walk worthy of the calling you have received. See, friends, you can tell a lot by the way a person walks. Paul urges the church in Ephesus to consider their walk, that it would be worthy of the calling to which they have been called. And Paul here uses intentional language when he describes our Christian life as a walk. It's no mistake. It's intentional. Let me give you a couple of reasons why I believe so. Firstly, Paul wants us to know that the Christian Christian life, that that, that Christianity, that our faith, is is not something that just takes up a certain corner of our life. Kenny mentioned this last week in his sermon. That Jesus doesn't come into our lives to do some, some minor renovations. That is not the gospel. Jesus comes in to completely change us. This is why we use the phrase, surrender your life to Jesus. Because by implication, that means you're going to surrender everything. Your ambitions, your desires, your resources, your bank account, your your relationships, your sexuality, everything. Surrender your life to Jesus. God is not a part-time lover. And we shouldn't treat him as such. The gospel takes 
over our entire being. And this, friends, this will impact our walk. This is why Paul emphasizes by speaking of walking worthily. He, he doesn't use the phrase we should sit or we should lie down. He says walk. Because when we walk, we are using our entire body. Our whole body is at work. And so we are to walk in a way that glorifies Him. We are to walk in a way that says, I belong to Jesus. And many of us know this, friends. We know this to be true, that that is, that is the standard of the gospel. That's what happens when Jesus comes in. We know this. That is why when things aren't going the way they should, we hide this. When we are in sin or when we are in pain, when we are hurting, instead of coming to Jesus for grace and healing, we hide. And we see it. You think you're fooling us, and maybe you are for a little bit, but after a while, we see it. Because now all of a sudden you're walking funny. Because you're trying to hide the fact that I'm Man, I'm not, I, I just don't feel well, but I don't want people to see it. So I, I got to, let me tell you a story. When I was in high school, I was an athlete. I don't know why some of you are laughing. And uh, I was a swimmer and a fairly good one, despite the fact that my skin tone is this way. I was doing transcultural things before we were transcultural. And, uh, but, but, but I lived in hostel, I lived in boarding school, and when you put a bunch of 14, 15, 16, 17 year old boys together with no real uh, role models and supervision, things, things go bad very quickly. And, and so I had hurt my shoulder, I don't remember what I was doing, I don't know if we were clowning around, or I just can't remember, but all I know is that I'd hurt my shoulder, but I had a swimming competition that weekend. And, and so I was going to class, going to my geography class, and my geography teacher was also my swimming coach. And I didn't want her to see that my shoulder was hurting because I wanted to swim. And so I walked in there, all slick, even though I was in so much pain. I, in fact, I went all the way around to my desk. There was a shorter route to where I usually sit, but I went all the way, I mean, guys, Come on. And so she watches me, but says nothing. And I walk, I mean, it's an awkward walk, because you know, you, cause this, cause this is how we normally walk, right? But now I'm like, I'm not gonna swing this arm, because it's gonna hurt my shoulder. And so I'm thinking so much about not doing that, that I don't realize that I'm walking like this. But she just watches me. I eventually sit down, and she says to me, on air, are you okay? Yes, ma'am. Perfectly fine. And class continues. Now, it was my right shoulder. The reason I know this is because I am right-handed. But all of a sudden, I'm doing everything with my left. I'm reaching for my books with my left. I'm trying to move things around with my left. And she knows this. On air, are you okay? Uh, yes, ma'am. Now I'm getting a little upset. Right? We do this all the time. We don't want people to notice. I haven't been to Sunday gatherings in a while. I haven't been to city group gathering. Please don't look at me. Hey, you're right. Yeah, I'm fine. Why are you asking? But we carry on. The lesson continues. She now gets up and begins to walk around looking at our work, making sure uh, that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. She comes over to me. She puts her hand on my shoulder and squeezes very gently. I, I mean, my eyes were this big. I'm clenching my teeth. I mean, she can't see my face because she's over me, right? Is everything okay? And the only thing that could come out of my mouth was, yes, ma'am. After class, while everyone was walking out, she came, uh, called me over and said, Honey, your shoulder's not all right, is it? No, ma'am, it's not. You need to go see a doctor, and I want you to bring back that report. 
but you're definitely not swimming this weekend. I'm telling you this because Paul here says that we are to walk in a manner that is, that is worthy, that glorifies God, that acknowledges that He is Lord over our lives. And when there is sin and pain in our lives, we are to go to the healer for grace and healing and not to hide it and just kind of play this pretend game of no, everything is okay when it's not. Stop hiding. I know that you're not okay. Otherwise, what happens is we allow greed to grow and it becomes like gangrene, and it keeps us from growing in our godliness. We allow lust to fester, and all of a sudden it creates this limp that keeps us from longevity in our marriages, in our relationship, in our faithfulness. Paul is intentional with his words here. Despite what people may think, there is a Christian lifestyle. There is one. There is a, a manner in which Christians are to live and in which they find blessings and display the gospel to the world. It is a lifestyle that says yes to some things and no to others because of the truths we believe in. And those truths govern our lives. 1 John Chapter 1 verse 7 says that we should walk in the light, referring to integrity and purity. It also tells us to walk in the truth, which means to hold fast to the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 says that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Romans 8 verse 4 says that we walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so the question, friends, is how is your walk? How is your walk? He's intentional with his language. Let me give you another reason why I believe Paul intentionally uses the word walk. Paul wants us to know that this term walk means that the, the Christian life is continuously progressing. Yeah. Continuously progressing. That, that none of us have arrived at our destination. That all of us are growing. All of us are always maturing. Paul says this of himself. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear friends and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Continuous progression. God's call to us is upward into ever-increasing knowledge of Him and an ever-increasing holiness to be empowered by the Holy Spirit as we advance the kingdom. Continuous progression and so my question is how is the progression of the gospel in your walk how's that going third reason and then we'll keep moving on why I believe Paul intentionally uses the word walk Paul speaks of the Christian life as a walk because it requires effort on our part see we will not increase in godliness and grace without applying ourselves in obedience to our Christian life. Now, now don't mishear me here, guys. Don't, 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 don't. Because I know the temptation is to say, Oné, are you talking about salvation by works? No, hold on. See, we receive salvation as a free gift. Paul's already unpacked this. Through no works of our own. But we then grow. We then grow what we refer to as sanctification, being set apart. We, we grow in our relationship with Jesus. And this requires obedience, which means that you must obey. That is effort on your part to say no to certain things so that you can say yes to the things that God has called you to. It requires effort. It doesn't just happen. We don't grow, grow through osmosis. 
requires obedience. The Christian life is a walk, and Paul says we are to compare our walk to the teaching of God's word found in the life of Jesus fueled by the Holy Spirit. And so I ask you again, how is your walk? How is your walk? What areas of your life are are, are you struggling? Are you limping? You're hurting? You're in pain? You're pretending? You're performing? Holy Spirit is saying, stop. Stop. And come to Jesus. Repent and believe. Obey. Therefore I, a prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. With humility, gentleness, patience, and love, Paul says. Humility. You see, you can't be a Christian without humility. You can't. Which should tell us that this is a supernatural thing. A proud person will never admit that they are sinful and are in desperate need of a savior. That I need the Holy Spirit to come and go, on it, ah ah. Ah ah. Humility is a supernatural thing. Pride is the greatest cause of unbelief. That I can save myself that I don't need a savior, that I've got it all together. The humble confess their guilt and recognize their need for mercy. We need the humility that grants salvation to continue to carry us in our sanctification. That it doesn't just end when you come to faith and now you you can do whatever you want. No, we need that same humility that God gives us and a salvation to continue in our sanctification. And so Paul puts it in there. He says, you want to walk in a manner that is worthy, that glorifies God, you're going to need some humility. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you, James says. But you're also going to need gentleness. Gentleness. Another word for it that we see in the scriptures is meekness. In fact, the Bible tells us that Moses was the meekest person on earth, second to Jesus, and yet he stood before Pharaoh and demanded, let my people go. You see, when we think of meekness, we think it's weak. It's not. To be gentle is not, is not weakness. Gentleness is power under control. Jesus was both the lion and the lamb. Power under control. We need to be gentle. Paul says that we also need to be patient. To be patient so that we can persevere. To be patient. I love the the, the kind of old school language. The old school word of patient is is to be long-suffering. We need to be long-suffering as the people of God. I know many of us, myself included, we pray that God would make us more patient. To be more long-suffering. But here's the thing, if you want to be long-suffering, you're going to need to learn how to suffer for long. Let me, let me say that again. Some, I think some of you might have missed that. So, so you want to be long-suffering? You want to be more patient? No problem. You're going to have to learn how to suffer for long and to not sin. And to not sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4 says this, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Let's work that backwards. How many of us want to be confident in the hope of our salvation? Okay, some of you. Some of y'all are like, 
One has done this before and it usually doesn't end well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna, my hope is that all of us wanna be confident in our hope of what God has done in us. So then Paul says here, then we need a strong character. Okay, cool, I want a strong character. Okay, then we need to develop endurance. Okay, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. Develop that endurance in me. Then he says, you're going to have to learn to rejoice when you run into problems and trials. Whoa. Uh, where, uh, where, where's that? Where is that in the Bible? Don't look too far. Just look to Jesus. He's patient with you. Unless you don't think you, you, you bring trouble to him. We need to be patient, friends. And then lastly, we see here that Paul calls us to love. To love. I love how the New Living Translation puts it. It says, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Now, this passage is not saying that we should become doormats for everyone. That's not what it's saying. Jesus was no doormat. But we need to learn how to love. To give allowance for each other's faults because we are filled with love. You want to grow in that area of your life? Get plugged into community. Amen. Get plugged into community. Because people are going to push you in community. I, I say this a lot to people. When people join a, a community or join Rooted, I, right out the gates, I'm, I'm super honest. I'm like, look, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, at some point as we continue to grow in our relationship, I'm going to do something that's going to be really, really stupid. I'm going to offend you. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to disappoint you. It's not malicious. Uh, please call me out so that I might, I might seek forgiveness, that I might repent. That you see, the, it's the gospel shining its light in the areas of darkness in my life. You're only making me better. My hope is that you would forgive me, that you would show love to me. It happens in community. You don't want to grow in this area you want to pretend that you're okay, live in isolation. Because then you walk around and you're like, yeah, well, you know, it's easy. It's easy to love when the room is empty. It is. But you start adding people to that room, now you're stretching that muscle called love. You're putting it to work. And Paul says, if, if we want to walk in a manner that glorifies our Father who is seated on His throne and fully in control. We better learn how to love. Now, now, why is all of this important? Why spend so much time on these first two verses? Well, it's important because P Paul here is speaking of unity. He, he's wanting to make us aware of, of, of the unity that we have in the gospel. Unity. He, he says it in verse 3 making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Unity. Now look, as a transcultural church and a guy who loves transculturalism, I'm often defined by others as the diversity guy. When I show up to uh, events or conferences, it's like, oh, on a, the diversity guy. Now look, I'm all about diversity, but, but I'm not the diversity guy. If you're going to give me a label, rather give me this one, the unity guy. Our end goal is unity, not diversity. See, when we pursue unity, we end up with diversity. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And, and I want us to see here that Paul doesn't say that we create this unity. Do you see that? He doesn't say we create this unity, but rather we maintain this unity. How come? Let scripture unpack scripture. Verse 4. Because there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Why do we maintain unity? Well, it's because the gospel brings about unity. 
We don't have to create unity. We just have to live in light of the gospel. And I think this is the mistake that many of us do because we don't press into the gospel, so we'd rather press into systems and structures and programs. Just press into the gospel. Why? Because in the gospel there is one body and one spirit. Our problem is not that we that we lack the creative ability for unity, but rather that we don't manifest our existing, already established unity in Christ. That's our problem. Our unity because of Christ is an obvious reality from the inside out because it's unity in the Spirit. Unity in the Spirit. Jesus prayed in John 17 verse 23, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. There was a time in this country when peace was being ushered in and then a table was being formed to figure out how do we bring about reconciliation and unity. And at that time, the church had a seat at the table. At that time, the, the church was leading that work. I wonder today. I wonder today. If our president wanted to, again, establish that table and say, hey, we need to bring some people around a table to figure out how, how, how we can press into reconciliation that brings healing, that, 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 that brings about unity. How can we do this? I wonder if the church will even get a phone call, let alone a seat at the table. Because I think society looks to the church and goes, you look like us. And in some places, you look worse. I know this sounds hard. And it is. I'm not going to lie to you, it is. This is why we need humility, gentleness, patience, and love. That's why. We need to be guarding our unity. Otherwise, we will find ourselves opposing the Spirit's work and the peace that Christ's death and resurrection has secured for us. We must each, therefore, strive to maintain unity. We must be willing to suffer practically any inconvenience rather than to disfigure this unity that the gospel already gives us. Paul then shifts. He shifts from spiritual unity to the implications of it, which is healthy diversity. That is the implication of, of, of unity is healthy diversity. He, he then shifts and now begins to speak about this. This kind of diversity that leads to the flourishing of the church. See, your creative uniqueness was not just given to you so that you can just stand out. No. No. It's so that we would fit together and display God's beautiful, masterful tapestry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 10, he says, Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, He ascended on high, He took the captives captive, He gave gifts to the people. But what does He ascended mean except that He also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens to fill all things. Now, we could... We could sit here for a very long time unpacking what this means. But let me be brief. See, Paul draws from Psalm 68, verse 18, to be specific. And here, he, as he talks about Jesus giving gifts, he's, he's kind of giving us the image of a war, which is what Jesus came to do. Jesus is our victorious warrior. He came and defeated sin, death, and Satan. And so, because he's victorious, not just in the heavenly places, but he's victorious in the lower parts as well. 
And so what did a victorious king do when he defeated his enemies? He would proudly walk through where they lived just so that all could see, no, he is the winner. And that, that, that's the picture that Paul gives us. Before he talks about these beautiful gifts, he goes, I want you to know that the one who gives it is a victorious king. He's victorious in the heavenly realms. He's victorious in the lower parts. He's victorious in your life. This is why we can have victory over sin. Paul wants to make sure that we fully understand before we go into the gifts and all the wonderful things that God wants to do in and through the church that the Lord who gives all the gifts is a mighty Lord who has ascended with all authority and power. This is why I love the words of Corey Ten Boom. She says, There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Victorious. Paul says, Jesus has descended into the lower places so that we might have victory in the lower places as well. See, victory is not just in the heavens. I've said it and I'll say it again. It's not just in the heavens, but it's also down below as well. This is why we confidently sing, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Now, once Paul has made sure that we understand that the giver of the gifts is all-powerful, he now begins to unpack the gifts. Oh, friends, I'm running out of time. Verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Again, I could spend so much time unpacking all these beautiful gifts. Maybe we'll create a time where we do so. But let me say this real briefly. The apostles and the prophets here, he's referring to the gift, not the office. There is a difference. See, the office had a specific purpose. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Where Paul tells us that, that, that the foundation has been laid by the prophets and the apostles. Jesus being the cornerstone, holding it all together. Prophets, Old Testament, apostles, New Testament. But now that's done. We're not adding anything to this book. So the office is done. But the gifts continue. Because the apostles literally means the sent out ones. They were those who always wanted to go into new territory, start new things. The prophets are the ones who spoke on behalf of God, interpreting his will, not telling something new, but rather revealing that which is already here. Unpacking the word of God, speaking truth boldly. Let me say that again. Boldly. One more time. Boldly Today, uh, we've redefined what it means to have the gift of a prophet. Back then, friends, if, if, if God was like prophet, I'm sure people were like, no, thank you. <laughs> God, what else do you have on the list? I, no, no. Because when a prophet walked into town, people were like, no. Because he is coming to say something that we don't want to hear. He's going to speak boldly. He's going to take the word of God and go, hey, here's what God's word says. Here's how you're living. It's two completely different things, repent and believe. No, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to, can you stay, can, can you talk about the things, serving? Talk about that. Don't talk about giving. Talk about serving. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, these are those who, who would want to go and just tell people about the gospel. They were always the bringers of good news. The shepherds, they nurture and care for God's people. The teachers, they educate and instruct. Five different gifts, amazing gifts. The thing is that these gifts were not created to operate on their own. Sin, however, wants us to believe so. Sin makes us compare our gifts to one another. It wants us to elevate one gift over the other. We become envious of other gifts, believing that they are better than the ones that Jesus has given us. This is why Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 5, he says, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think, 
Instead, think sensibly. A lot of thinking here. A lot of renewing of one's mind. As God has distributed a measure of faith to each, now as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function. Did you hear that? In the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. The spiritual gift Christ has given us does not belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the body. So therefore, we must use our gifts in the church and the church relies on us to do so. They are given with great expectation on Jesus' part. He expects us to use them to bring power and victory in the church. Amen. So why do you possess the gift that you have? I'm glad you asked. Verse 12 says to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. It's simple, it's plain, it's clear, it's in the text to equip the saints and to do so spiritually, biblically and with practical tools needed to fulfill that which God has called us to do. The church, among many things, is a place of training and preparation. Amen. Training and preparation. Yeah. For what, Honor? To walk worthy of the calling oh. you have received. Okay. Training and preparation to walk worthy of the calling you have received, individually and corporately. And I know some are sitting here going, but Honor, I don't know. I don't know what it is that God's called me to. I'm about to reveal it to you today. Oh, this is, this is the Sunday you wanted to come. I'm about to tell you what God has called you to do. That thing that you have been searching for for months and years, I'm going to reveal it to you today. And it is going to blow your mind. You ready? God, in His glory, clothed in majesty, seated on his throne, fully in control, calls you, each and every one of you that have crossed the line of faith, he calls you, wait for it, to love him with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your being. Huh? Mind blown? Ah, but there's more. Just wait. He also, I hope you guys are writing this down. He also calls you to love your neighbor yeah. as you love yourself. Yeah. I know some of you are like, oh, no, you, are you a prophet? Are you pro prophesy, men of God? There's more. He calls you. He calls you to go and make disciples yeah. of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. That's your calling. Amen. Now, some of you are going, oh, no, I'm looking for specifics. Where do you live? You'll find your specifics there. Where do you play? You'll find your specifics there. Where do you work? Ha, you'll find your specifics there. You see, it's in the context of community that God molds us and shapes us and reveals to us the specifics within the calling. But all of us have been called to that. Yeah, amen. And many of us are forfeiting that, trying to figure out, okay, but exactly, but, but where, where? Which company? Which, which city? Which, which neighborhood? Which, which, which? God's going, no, no, before I reveal that stuff to you, go make disciples. Yeah. Love me. Love your neighbor as you love the person sitting there. Just love them. Start there. You'll realize how, how difficult it is. The person you see every day. But you're out here crying out to God, call me to the nations. You can't even love the person right next to you. The church, that's you and me, should seek to enable one another to know what to do, how to do it, and we provide resources to do it. Let me say that again. The church, that's you and me, with all the gifts that God has given us, knowing fully well that we've been called 
to walk a, 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 a life that is, that is worthy. We should seek to enable one another to know what to do. This is why we preach the Bible Sunday in, Sunday out. You want a good self-help book? Go to exclusive books. And guess what you'll find there as well? The Bible. It's almost like they know. Like we've got all these books here, but man, you know, what you're actually looking for is here. We enable one another to know what to do, how to do it. This is discipleship. Come and walk with me. Let me. I don't. You know, the, the, the question I get the most from people who just crossed the line of faith, young believers, is, "I love Jesus, but I don't know what to do." Great question. Follow me as I follow Christ. And then we provide resources how to do it. And where do we get those resources from? It's not a trick question. It's from the body, from, from you, from the gifts that God, God has given each and every one of you. We provide the resources to do it. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every kind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. Nala, Stephen, you guys can come up. I'm wrapping up here. See, friends, we need a a healthy gospel-saturated community. That's what we need. So that we're not like little children tossed by every easy, really cool Instagram, like hashtag. No, guys, we need the word of God. Pure and simple. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ from him the whole body fitted and knitted together by every supporting ligament pro- promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual uh, let me close with this I like this illustration if you're not into sports forgive me but it's good and it works uh, see when a sports team wins a game the players celebrate but so do the fans and there's this language that we use. We go, we won. Now, now, there's a lot of truth in that because we did win. But there is a difference. There is a difference in the way that the players celebrate and the spectators celebrate. The, the Christian life is not a spectator sport. And we have a lot of spectators. Even in here. They show up, they sit, they watch, they cheer. We won. There's a massive difference for those who come in early, open up, plug in, sing, practice, gather during the week, get plugged into community, discipleship. They give of their time, talents, and money. I don't want anyone to miss it. Money. They give generously, sacrificially. They apply the gifts that God has given them to the flourishing of this local church so that we might be a blessing to the city and beyond. It's like a player. He shows up on Monday to train. Tuesday, Wednesday, he's part of the team. And then game day, he shows up and he plays and she plays. And and, and when they win, they celebrate on the spectators going, yay! And then they go home because they watched a really good game. I say that because there's also a difference between the criticism of a spectator and the criticism of the one standing right beside you as you're playing. And we do this all the time. Kick the ball, stupid. Pass, you idiot. It's easy to do that when you're just watching. It's different when you're on the field and it's like the reason I didn't pass the ball to you but rather went this way is because we can see what's coming in front of us and so I need you to go around so that I might pass this way so that we can go there and score and win. It's different. And so my call to you is, are you going to play? Or are you going to watch? God has called us to so much more so much more and we can only do that if we are unified God help us and so Father God we thank you for your word we thank you that you 
continue to speak to us. And so, Lord, would you convict where conviction is needed? Some of us are sitting here way too comfortable. And so, would you disrupt the comfortable? But some of us are hurting. We're hurting. We're in pain. And so, Holy Spirit, would you comfort those who feel disrupted? But the hope is that you would unify us, that you would bring all of us to a place where we look to you and we say, one body, one spirit, one baptism, one faith, one Lord, Father of all. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.